This is the third video for Unit 1, Biology 101. In the last video, uh, video number two, I finished up talking about scientists who contributed to the development of scientific thought and understanding of the natural world. In this third video, I'm going to be going over some terms and approach of scientific method. The term that I have up, uh, natural selection, uh, presently, uh, I'll talk about in just a minute, but I should uh, give a disclaimer. This part of science, especially biology, is probably the most controversial topic or area that I can think of, and that's talking about the origins of life. People will sometimes uh, become upset and offended, uh, depending on what the discussion is. That's not my intention, but I will put forth a few ideas for you to be familiar with. Scientists, uh, over a period of time, have uh, taken up the idea of natural selection. It was proposed by Charles Darwin back in the 1800s. And the idea of natural selection is that there are envir environmental forces that will tend to cause some organisms to favor uh, structures and a way of life over other structures. And what Charles Darwin claimed was, this is what drove evolution. It took many, many years. Hence, that's where uh, Charles Lyle's work with geology come in with the idea of an old earth. Well, the idea is that uh, the natural selection occurs naturally from natural phenomena. Uh, most people don't believe this, and uh, I recall my uh, biology teachers, most of them, uh, when I was working for my undergrad uh, degree, the ones that I talked to, didn't really hold to natural selection, even though that's what they taught. They held to something closer to what one might call supernatural selection, because they didn't think that humans could arise by chance, randomly, from dirt and water, from slime, uh, without some help. And so uh, several of my instructors thought that uh, there was a God and that he helped in the process. However, if one thinks that, it's no longer natural selection, but it's supernatural selection because it's beyond the natural. Though I, I don't know that, I, that I've heard that expression used, but I throw it out there just to help people think about it. Most biology texts, most biologists hold to evolution as being the explanation for how life came to be and how humans came to be. And uh, the, the biology text and publications teach you just entirely by chance. Something that you don't hear about in the news, but back in the 1990s, gatherings of biology teachers discussed the idea of evolution and whether to include God in the conversation or not. And um, it was a, it was quite the discussion. I don't know that it made it into the major news media, but um, it was recognized that the majority of Americans, uh, well over 80 percent, uh, do not believe in evolution by chance. That's how humans came to be. And so biology teachers from around the United States discussed this, and they, they understood it, but they decided to, to completely leave God out of the discussion and just teach evolution by chance. Creationists would be another group, and there are um, many creationists across the United States who believe that uh, humans came about by creation from a creator. And one of the one big difference that should be noted, if you're ever listening to a discussion between evolutionists and creationists, evolutionists believe in or hold to an old earth, creationists hold to a young earth. Uh, evolutionists, billions of years, creationists, thousands of years, uh, earth, the strict creationists, uh, an earth less than 10,000 years old. If you were to have asked me 20 years ago about intelligent design, I would have thought that uh, creationism and intelligent design were the same. They're synonymous. But actually, that's not the case. There are atheists that hold to intelligent design. Creationists would usually hold to the idea of intelligent design, but not all intelligent design uh, 
people are creationists. And there are some atheists who don't see it being statistically possible that life came about by chance, by evolution, but they don't necessarily believe in God, so they don't have an explanation for it, but they see that there seems to be a great organization in living things. This last theory, I came up with a name for it probably just in the last 10 years. I heard about this, read about it. The most famous person that I know of that held to this theory and uh, supported it was Francis Crick, who was awarded a Nobel Prize for his work in 1953 in helping to discover the structure of DNA along with James Watson and Maurice Wilkins. And probably because there was a Nobel laureate that held to this theory, uh, gave it support. Francis Crick was an, an outspoken atheist. He's now dead, but he is claimed to, to have held to this theory. And I don't know if it was because he just didn't see that evolution could have happened entirely by chance from rocks and slime and water. Uh, but um, there are two ideas with this panspermia theory. And the, the main idea is that biological or bacterial spores were brought from some other place in the universe and deposited on the earth. Some claim by meteorites. The first time I heard this theory, uh, the explanation I heard was, or read, was that uh, aliens came from outer space, spacecraft, and landed on the earth and spread bacterial spores and then took off. And from those bacterial spores, life arose and eventually humans. It may sound uh, comical to some people, but some people hold to it, and very seriously so. Scientists are interested in answering questions and uh, trying to find causes of phenomena that they see. And so scientists are very interested in cause and effect relationships. Generally, some effect or phenomena is seen. There's some kind of a result. And the question arises, what caused that result? So scientists begin work uh, gathering information, forming hypotheses, and performing experiments to try to determine cause and effect relationships. Generally, they'll set up what's called a controlled experiment, where they will have a group that uh, is controlled, there, there's no change in what's applied to it, and they compare that, that to a group or groups that have change applied to them. There are terms that one needs to recognize in a controlled experiment. I'll start with the independent variable, or experimental variable as it's called by some. And this is the part of the experiment that is allowed to change. And it's purposefully changed so that those that are watching the experiment can see what changing the experimental variable does to the outcome of the experiment. And the part of the experiment that does not have the independent or experimental variable is called the control. Everything's kept the same, but it does not have the experimental variable applied to it. What happens as a result of an experimental variable being applied is called the dependent variable. That would be the result or the effect. So a good example would be, uh, you may have uh, read at some point that using aquarium water that uh, you use for your fish is good to put on your plants. And as it turns out, that's true. It, it does uh, provide chemicals that your plants need. It fertilizes them. But you might set up an experiment where you have water uh, from the tap or just rainwater, whatever water you would put into the fish aquarium. You would apply that to a number of plants, and those would be your control. For another set of plants, you would take water out of your aquarium, specifically the bottom of the aquarium, if you could, uh, siphon it out of the bottom. That's where a lot of the fish waste ends up being deposited in the aquarium. And you would water your plants with that water. You'd give them the same amount of water. It'd be the same temperature for the same time of the day. All the plants would have the same amount of light, and they'd be the same type of plants. Everything would be the same, but what you would vary would be the type of water that you'd give one versus the other. The group again, that would receive the fish water, would be receiving the experimental variable, also called the independent variable. 
the group of plants that would receive just uh, tap water or whatever water that would originally been put in the fish aquarium, that would be the control. And of course, what you'd look for over a period of time would be a change in the plants. And uh, the change in the plants, uh, whether how much they grow, would be the dependent variable. And we would expect the plants with the fish water to grow faster and look healthier than those with just the tap water. And generally, when you do experimentation, that causes more questions to arise. What, it is, what is it in the water that's helping the plants to grow? Because maybe you, if you don't have a, an aquarium of fish, you might be able to provide the plants with the chemical that's in the aquarium. And it turns out uh, generally that would be uh, urea or uric acid or ammonia. Uh, any of those would contain nitrogen, which is important for plants to grow. All living organisms need nitrogen in one form or another. The next uh, uh, term terms that I have, a set of terms would be inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. I don't uh, get into uh, logic and debate, but uh, or philosophy in here in, in, in great detail. Though with inductive reasoning, this is where a, a person would gather individual facts and from individual facts come up with a general statement that would uh, explain those facts or explain phenomena. With inductive reasoning, one might start by looking at birds and might say sparrows have wings, cardinals have wings, hawks have wings, therefore birds have wings. Deductive reasoning is the opposite direction. You start with the general statement, birds have wings, since blue jays have wings, blue jays must be birds also. So different approaches in reasoning and understanding and those are important in scientific reasoning. It should be noted that if there is bias, uh, the scientific method and the scientific approach don't work very well because people don't tend to see the facts, they don't recognize the facts when they're in front of them because of bias. A good example of where the facts can be obvious to some and not others, years ago some uh, archaeologists were exploring and digging in uh, Hell's Creek, I think in Montana, Wyoming or Montana, out west, uh, paleontologists who were trying to uh, unearth dinosaur bones, and they did. And it was noted that the bones had a, a rotten tissue smell to them, as if they were rotting. <laughs> but the uh, people who were doing the paleontology didn't give it much more thought and uh, just passed off the odor as, as part of the job. There's a woman who's uh, from one of the universities in North Carolina. She had a background in anatomy physiology. And she did work in paleontology. And when she experienced that odor with the bones, she reasoned that the, uh, the flesh was rotting. And she took some samples of the bone marrow, and she found red blood cells. And up to that point, it was not thought that red blood cells would be able to be found in uh, bones, uh, dinosaur bones, because of the age of the bones. And so that brought up the question, were the bones really as old as they were, or could red blood cells last longer than they thought? But it took somebody from a different background to question what they were experiencing. So you have to be open, you have to be willing to think differently sometimes to appreciate the answers that are right in front of you, or the facts at least. The next term I have would be hypothesis, and this would be a, uh, a beginning idea, uh, a good educated guess, a uh, prediction. This is where scientists start. Now, after they, they've gathered information, they made observations, they'll usually come up with a hypothesis or hypotheses and begin to test these. After a hypothesis has been tested and given quite a bit of support, it will move on to the stage of being a theory. Theories are very broad, whereas a hypothesis is very narrow in its scope. Theories are very broad. Also, a hypothesis needs to be falsifiable. You need to be able to test it to show that it's false. Principles uh, would be a theory that has a lot of support uh, applied in a narrow way. 
laws are very general and uh, you can